time is always worth the price of admission. Our next speaker is someone whom you all know, but you may not know some of his some of his extensive background. Walter Reddy uh, didn't come on the scene of constitutional activism day before yesterday or even last year. He's been a constitutional activist since 1970, when he succeeded in collecting petitions which called for a constitutional amendment, the 26th Amendment, to give 18-year-olds the right to vote. In 1993, he worked with a group of 10 other activists that lobbied legislators in Hawaii to introduce and to pass a 10th Amendment resolution. I think that was the first, if not one of the first, in the country. And within two years of that, more than 22 states had followed with similar legislation, and we know where that's been going since then. In 1994, Walter and other patriots went to Philadelphia, state capital, Pennsylvania, and lobbied the state legislators there to stop the call for a constitutional convention that was aimed at replacing the United States Constitution with that horrendous document called the New States Constitution. And later in 1994, when he went to move to Orange County, New York, he teamed up with a county legislator to draft some legislation revitalizing the Orange County militia. Unfortunately, that work was stopped after the media had thoroughly demonized the word militia uh, because of the alleged involvement of various people in the bombing of the federal building of Oklahoma City. In 1996, Walter produced and hosted two television programs, one covering that Oklahoma City bombing, his guest being General Ben Parton, who of course did some uh, very interesting work as an expert in the field of explosives, uh, looking into the question of exactly how many bombs were involved in that attack and where they had been placed, and raising the question of how Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols had had access to the inside of the building to put bombs there. The second show covered uh, the book Vote Scam, The Stealing of America by James Collier. Then in February 2007, Walter met Ron Paul at the New Hampshire Free State Project's Liberty Forum, and he became an activist in Ron Paul's campaign. On Independence Day, 2008, Walter founded the Committee for Safety Organization. Which, which hosted last year's Boston Tea Party, and of course is the host of this year's Boston Tea Party. And on April 19th of 2009, Committees of Safety hosted another event after a little bit of bureaucratic hassling to get a permit to use the official staging area, Lexington Green, in Lexington, Massachusetts. And the purpose of that event was to honor and commemorate the courage of the well-organized Lexington militiamen who stood their ground against the British troops. And at that particular uh, ceremony, the Committees of Safety invited the newly formed Oath Keepers organization to join. A number of their people attended. And some 400 patriots ended the event by taking an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And to be sure, we have no limit of enemies, both foreign and domestic. And so I give you the leader of Committees for Safety, and our host today, Walter Redd. These are the times that try men's souls. Summer soldier in the summer, sunshine patriot will, and this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves love and thank you, man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. That was Thomas Paine. Um, he 
December 19, 1776. I'll tell you, I want, I want to welcome all you winter patriots for coming out on this, uh, this brisk day today. Um, I think it's pretty easy to show up when it's nice sunny with the sunshine patriots, wave some signs, but it's going to take a little more than that. It takes a lot of self-sacrifice and perseverance because we truly do have these domestic, I think the domestic enemies are even greater than the foreign enemies. Committees of Safety have laid out a, a plan of action, and that's what we really need are the activists. Um, Dr. Vieira has laid out in great detail in his most recent book, Constitutional Homeland Security, exactly that structure, and we covered quite a bit of it today, a little more of the detail of what the proper constitutional role is for the revitalize state militia. Um, committees of safety are going to be working on basically three main groups we're reaching out to. Um, one has to do with our state legislators and governors. And we have we have now over like 500 state legislators and a few governors that have signed on to the 10th Amendment resolution, which is great. It's really picked up momentum. Um, the majority of the states have passed it. Recently, uh, this summer, I was down in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. They had the National Conference of State Legislators, with a thousand of them were down there. We must have had 200 state legislators that were on board with us, enough to where it really shook up the powers that be. They came over and wanted to know, I, I wanted to know if they were on board with us. And one of the leadership of that National Conference of State Legislators stated to me, I can't say that I am. And I went, why not? <laughs> and he goes, it's gonna cause chaos. And I thought about that for a minute, and I thought later, not for the people. It would cause chaos for the international banking cartel. Our plan is, is pretty simple. We want to we want to introduce a sound, stable money system, monetary system, into the state, and that that in itself. We, the State Depository, which Scott Silver will be talking a little more about uh, following me. But if we have a State Depository that's, that has immunity, a State sovereignty, uh, just in itself. And it will, the second layer of protection will be this, this revitalized State Militia, that's also a State institution that physically protects that gold and silver. So that's, that's basically the plan. During the colonial period, and all the way for almost 300 years, we had this system in place. It was all males between 16 and 60. In Massachusetts, I think it was even 15 to 60, were required to, it was part of their duty to participate in, in their, the security of the community and of the colony, and then this later to be the states. From the early 1600s right up to like 1903, um, when that Dick Act of 1903 was created. That include the <laughs> And uh, yeah, that was an unconstitutional act. I, I spoke to Ron Paul about this a few weeks ago and how, um, how this was an unconstitutional act. He, he wasn't that familiar with it until, but he said,